gonna start. How are you guys? Welcome to Chavistas Chronicles from Caracas. Uh, today we have uh, uh, the pleasure to have again with us Terry Matson that uh, has been working recently a lot with Code Pink in Washington DC. We interviewed her, I believe that it was in March. March or April. April. Yes, I was here okay, with the anti sanctions campaign delegation. And uh, after that she she is an a very uh, experienced uh, delegation promoter to Venezuela and to other countries. But anyway, we already talked about that and today we wanna talk about her recent visit to Cuba, her okay. impression uh, on the visit to Venezuela. She has been already in Caracas for how long? For like I have a like for three days. Yeah. And uh, for the fifteenth time. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes. Twelve or fifteen times. She Lost is already a Venezuelan connoisseur. <laughs> And what else? And we want to talk also about Code Pink and her experience working with them. And while talking about Cuba and Venezuela, we want to highlight some issues related to the sanctions and in Cuba and Venezuela. So let's start. Well, first I have to say it's just great to be back yes, and spending yes, some time nice visiting time. with you. This is a completely impromptu um, interview this afternoon, and so. Um, I have no pink on, <laughs> yes, <laughs> although yes. we will be talking about code pink. And so the last time that we we did this, yeah, it was March, April, maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe yes, right I around mean. the coup, yeah, April 30th, something because mm -hmm. um, I had been here um, leading an anti-sanctions campaign delegation in the state yes, for several true. months, and um, and then went back to the U.S. in June to supposedly visit friends on the East Coast mm -hmm. and uh, ended up going from New York down to Washington, D.C. to visit my congressman to uh, talk about what it was like living here in Venezuela for three plus months under sanctions, what the day-to-day -day life is here, mm -hmm. and how amazingly well people are navigating despite all the obstacles. I mean, it's a real testament to the Venezuelan people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So then I went down to Washington and had several days of meetings, and one of those meetings was a dinner with Medea Benjamin, one of the co-founders of Code Pink. So, and yeah, out of that dinner came a job offer, and um, and I uh, went back to San Francisco and packed and moved in two weeks. That was started crazy, working yes. uh, in Washington with Code Pink in mid June. Yeah, it's been seven months. Joe has been like it's happy been incredible. Ever after. I know. It's been a, it's been a, it's been amazing work with amazing people. And, um, and it's so nice to be with people who understand solidarity mm -hmm. and who um, can amplify our voices. They have such a large platform and such a large audience that um, it's a great space to amplify our work. It was totally unexpected, but just a gift on a lot of levels because I'm kind of old to be starting, this was like the third career for me. Uh -huh. And so it's a real gift at my age to have this opportunity to just have a whole new career, yes, one that's, that's really legitimately, you know, in a very organized, through, through an organized association mm -hmm. to be doing solidarity work. It's rare. So you told me that your expectations were blown up. I had, you know, you don't know what to expect, right? You know, mm -hmm. you just know it's a good group of people and the people that I've known and worked with more obliquely over the years, not, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. as intimately as now. But, um, but yeah, just so much better. That's nice. It's just, I was telling yeah, you, I don't know that behind you cameras, better, but behind <laughs> cameras, yeah. yes. that, that, that is nice when you have, like in my case, an impression about an organization mm -hmm. like the one that I have on Code Pink, and and then you talk with someone that is really inside, yeah. and, 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 and that person tells you that, that, that the it's more, is better. yeah. I, I don't. Uh, I don't want to say better because it's a really solid organization. It's mm -hmm. a good solid organization. It's more. I think mm -hmm. the better way to define it is that's fine. it's more that's fine. than that's what good. I. That's good. Yeah, that's it's good. so much more, and um, and really great. And that's so good. what happened in June was that uh, the Code Pink was looking to develop a Latin America um, department, and that has come out of 
year, Medea Benjamin's years of activism related to Cuba mm -hmm. and, and Honduras too, but really her you know roots in, well, in Cuba. And she always had this vision of developing you know, a campaign in Latin America. And so we started working on that in June, me being the first hire. And then later in the summer, um, Leonardo Flores and Michelle Elmer, both Venezuelan, mm -hmm. came to work um, with us as well. And so we have a really powerful team. I'm like, Michelle I'm like the least experienced person on the team. <laughs> Michelle is the daughter of Steve. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. That's nice. Yeah. And you know what's really wonderful, and I think Michelle will tell you this really, you know, quite directly, is how that in this position to be in an activist position where she can really talk about what her country mm -hmm. in Venezuela and what's happening here and to have a public voice. And she and she seems to really be enjoying that. She's quite good at it. And of course, Leonardo is an excellent writer. Yes, yes, he writes yeah. a lot. He's very and we good. love what he writes, yes. by the way. And yes. He's got a lot of experience. And, and you know, and both of them are from Venezuela, so it's um, really You're wonderful. not going to Venezuela? I'm not. <laughs> no, you're not, though. I didn't no, know that. No, it was Venezuela, yes. No Venezuela. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. I didn't know it. Yeah, we both are. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, and I am just, you know, I, in my I know, heart. I know they're green. <laughs> In my heart, I'm Venezuelan. No, no, no. no. So we do That's work, um, you know, a lot of our work is focused on Venezuela, but of course, um, in the last, you know, four to six weeks, we've had been very focused on Bolivia. Of course. And since the coup of November 20th, and Medea Benjamin was actually yes. in La Paz, yes, so on the so ground, so reporting that. live. And so those of you listening, you can see some of that original content news produced by her. Um, at codepink.org slash Bolivia News. She's so all the original like, content. Like, like what? One, Couple two weeks? weeks? Two weeks, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then and now someone Wyatt, from why? Why Reed from Grey Zone is exactly, there now. Exactly, yeah. stay there. And she asks yeah. encourages people to, to follow him in order yes. to be updated about what happened. It's live yes. on the ground, mm -hmm. unfiltered mm -hmm. by the U.S. mainstream yes. media yes. reporting. Yes. So, yes. Yes. so there's some good stuff on that web page. It's nice. It's so nice. we're doing some good things with this Latin America team. It's really so you know, what are your plans? I mean to I mean what is your objective, your goals for two thousand twenty? Well, to keep developing our work. Mm -hmm. You know, the three of us have been working together officially since September. September well, whatever the first working day of September mm -hmm. was in the States, the third thing. Mm -hmm. Um so, you know, we're we're developing our 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 format, our work structure, you know, we each um, specific skills and experiences to the team, and so who does what, and it's all really evolving really nicely. It's That's very nice. exciting. One of the other things that we have developed is a weekly webinar, Wednesdays, 12 p.m., what the F is going on in Latin America, 20 minutes of hot news That's every fun. Wednesday, just That's a fun. quick webinar, yeah, That's so fun. That's, That's a really it. fun. Too. It's nice. It's nice. Yeah. So and the radio programs and, and print media and, all and the a crazy lot of activity. activism yes, throughout yes. DC. One of the really wonderful opportunities we had, and you and I were just talking about this uh -huh. before. Camacho right thing, yeah. right? <laughs> it was we nice. were asked. We were approached by uh, Bolivian Americans, expatriated Bolivians, pro Morales. This is very uh, rare. To find in the U.S. Yes. yes, in the greater D.C. area, they had um, were interested in doing an action at the Inter-American Dialogue on the day that Camacho was speaking, and they asked us to work in solidarity with them. And it was their action, and we went and supported them, did the filming and stuff. But I have to tell you, for their first organized disruption, they really <laughs> they did a magnificent job. Yes. I mean, it was very that yes. nobody was expecting it. Which I saw it and I love really, it. Really, very successful. So, um, so we'll continue working in solidarity with them as well, and um, and working with the greater Latino community, in Washington D.C. and throughout the country. You know, this project is to really get U.S. citizens focused on U.S. foreign policy towards Latin America. The interventionism specifically. That's fine. And interventionism in all its forms, not just military, 
And as we were talking earlier, one form of interventionism is economic interventionism, yes. such as the so embargo on so. Cuba and the sanctions against Venezuela. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, that, that's something that we should talk about now, right? Yes. About your yeah. experience. Well, we were talking behind the cameras and about your experience, I mean, in your recent trip to Cuba. Yes. And, and what you saw in terms of the problems with the fuel. Well, this right? is, yes. So last week, um, December 14th through the 21st, Code Pink mm -hmm. led a delegation of 52 people to Cuba. And the purpose of the delegation was for the anniversary of the Obama administration's opening of, reopening yeah. of um, diplomacy with Cuba. And that was December 17th. 2014. So this was, so we were actually five there years, yes. at the five-year anniversary and there to um, promote going back to that foreign policy and beyond. I mean, that was a start, but we yes. needed to go well beyond that. So we were actually on the ground December 17th. We arrived on the 14th and we were able to visit the U.S. Embassy on the 17th. Okay. We visited with... Um, you didn't have any problem with the box, ultrasonic box? Well, no, we didn't have, we didn't walk out of there with what they call the Vanna Syndrome. <laughs> but I will, I will share with you and your audience that we tried to um, formally organize, um, arrange for a meeting with the embassy well before our arrival. Uh, phone calls, emails, insider tracking, and nothing. nothing. And I, I got my own congressman involved in trying to set up a meeting. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And um, ultimately, we sent numerous emails from different addresses with different purposes for meeting, like five different reasons to meet. Nice and the, the one that the one that they responded to was the one about potential business opportunities <laughs> in Cuba. So that was one of the strategies. We're interested in small business opportunities. They weren't interested in talking about human rights or diplomacy or you know environmentalism or any of those more progressive it's things. Nice, it was like nice. Business, that was the one they responded to. We're interested in talking with somebody at the embassy about small business opportunities. Mm -hmm. And the answer, they, so they responded to that one and the response was, I'm sorry at this time, don't have staff available mm -hmm. to meet with you. So, on the morning of December 17th, 17 of us showed up on the sidewalk out in front of the embassy. No, and um, and uh, they let us in eventually. We met with um, not the consul general, but uh, the, the assistant consul mm -hmm. general. Um, so we had, I don't know, 15 minutes. So, and it was, it was good that we were able yes. to voice our opinion, particularly voice our opinion on that day. That's so, so, but you know, it, it was it was not easy. You know, we had 52, we had 51 U.S. citizens and one Canadian with us, and that's a large delegation for the U.S. Embassy to ignore. Mm -hmm. And we pretty much were ignored until we showed up on the sidewalk. That's fine. But we got but in, and we had, yeah, we got in, and we were able to voice our opinion, and it was a fairly, you know, it was a decent. But this was, this particular trip was my second with Code Pink, not as a, not as Code Pink staff. I was um, on the February 2015 trip where they had arranged for 150 people to go down to celebrate the Obama administration's opening with Cuba okay. December 14th. Mm -hmm. So we went on Valentine's Day, February 15th, 150 people was incredible was an incredible experience. But, so that was the last time I was there until this December. And it's really obvious that there's no traffic in the streets. If you've the been fuel there yes. And yeah, there's the, the fuel, the transportation fuel comes from Venezuela. Yes. And of course, those ships have been sanctioned. Mm -hmm. And so the fuel's not getting to Cuba and uh, you, yeah. And so yeah, average no, people are having a hard time getting to work, or having a hard time running their small businesses, and... Um, so you notice the, 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 the effects of sanctions? It's, it's over, yeah, for anybody who's been there before, yeah. I mean, if it was your first time, um, you probably just say, oh, you know, gosh, there's light traffic, mm -hmm. or everybody uses public transportation, mm -hmm. which they do, 
are using public transportation. But um, but yeah, for the taxis, for small business owners. To yeah, even for tourists, and you were telling me, right, that you cannot go easily. You can't get uh, out of the city. To the countryside, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very hard, you know. And I was telling you that here in Venezuela, we, in recent, for the last maybe one or two weeks, we have been suffering of that problem also. And, and that take us back to the sanctions also. Yes. I was telling you that uh, in the countryside, outside Caracas, I mean mostly, especially to the, to the west of Venezuela, there has been uh, problems with uh, supply of fuel. Yeah. I mean... Well, and so then what happens when you when you have you have lack of supply of fuel? That means it's not only your own personal transportation, but like all the trucks that the farmers use mm -hmm. to get their produce to market. Yes. That produce isn't yeah, leaving the farms and getting into the towns. The supply chain. So yes. it's not that there's not food. Mm -hmm. It's that there's no way to get the food to market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or yes. in a timely manner. So, 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 but, but, but we were talking behind cameras about that and how that affect people's life, yeah. normal people, that, yes. as we were talking, people that like you and not, 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 the, not the, the, the top politicians like yeah. Maduro or, you know, minister of the, the Venezuelan or government the top, or the, the top business people, uh -huh, uh -huh, exactly. most or importantly their, them, or the richest people yeah. in, in Venezuela, uh, but the regular guys like you and me, like the majority of people our are friends. the ones affected yeah. by the sanctions. Especially our friends in the countryside. Yeah. And it is terrible. Yeah, it's very, and I think that's that's the biggest thing that people in the states and other and citizens of allied countries with the United States that this is this these sanctions, these coercive unilateral you know, measures, measures, economic economic warfare. I think it needs to really be discussed and understood as a tool mm -hmm. of warfare. Yes. It is warfare against the general population of a country. I mean. By the way, Alliance for Global Justice have a nice initiative. Did you hear about yes. that? Manitos Children I'm, Fund. Yes, I'm sit, I sit on the steering committee. I represent uh -huh. Code Pink. Okay, on that, okay, yes. that's, I'm that's so honored great. because I that's was invited great. by by Chuck Kaufman of AFGJ that's to great. represent Code Pink on the steering committee, mm -hmm. and um, and um, he's in conversation now with Medea yeah. Benjamin about perhaps a larger role for Code Pink, but. I want to raise awareness about, I mean, the fact that sanctions kill people, and right. they want basically yeah. to yeah, raise it's funds. Like, it's to like a medieval siege on a city. Exactly. Starve them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not, yeah. And I think the, the thing here, and every time I come, I, I say this and feel it even more strongly, is that I personally believe because of the political evolution in Venezuela, due to the Bolivarian Revolution and what happened in 98 and what's continued, people in this country are particularly aware, and I would say throughout Latin America, but even more so here, mm -hmm. because you're very empowered over the last 20, politically empowered over yes. the last 20 years, and, um, and have really evolved. And that can never be taken away from you. Yes. And that, in, and most, People throughout Latin America, regardless of their politics, will say that about Venezuelans. That that can never, you're never going to go back mm -hmm. because of that political evolution from the ground up. People so. who were so, you know, who were not even considered citizens, not even counted in the mm -hmm. census, mm -hmm. now participate fully in society. And, and I think mm -hmm. I see that even more strongly every time I come. Because despite the sanctions, and it's, it's, I mean, that's me dura. Mm -hmm. That, <laughs> tough, yes. yeah. But people on the streets are still friendly. They still talk to you. You know, the subway is crowded, but people make room for you and, and smile and talk. People still go out on dates on Friday nights. Mm -hmm. People are still living. Mm -hmm. And I think that's possible because, in general, the population understands this is an external form of interventionism and warfare. Yes. And despite however someone in this country voted in May of 2018, mm -hmm. the bigger issue is no U.S. interventionism. Yes, we were talking about yeah. that. Before. And so people are Venezuelans first. 
yes. political and party anti, second. And anti-imperialism. Yes. So it's like Venezuelan and an anti-imperialism at yeah. the same time. And you know? then your political party comes somewhere into it. Mm-hmm. And sanctions only exacerbate that anti-imperialism yeah. And yes. even me, me, they're not it, solving it they're exactly. It. It, it, yeah. And in the U.S., they believe in Washington. I mean, they believe that sanctions, as we were talking before, uh, uh, are going to make Venezuelans rise up against Maduro or something like that. Like that. But anybody which is, who understands Venezuela and her exactly, people would know that was never going to happen. It's a big lie. <laughs> it was yes, never but happen. I, I, I wanted to raise that because. Maybe it's one of these happen. days someone in Washington is going to realize that sanctions didn't work in Cuba. They never are going to work in Venezuela. And they are actually... ¿cómo se dice? Like helping... Well, they're uh, helping uh, create a greater sense of nationality, yes, right? Yes, yeah. and they are helping Maduro uh, uh, stay in power because... People are because, uniting around them. Yes, yeah. yes, that's my impression. That's yeah. my impression. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it, this the, the, this form of intervention is, a, is creating a very strong sense of nationality mm-hmm. among Venezuelans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, you can really feel it's like it. Like a pride. Yes. 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 For, definitely. Mm-hmm. And why not? Mm-hmm. You know, it's your nation. Yes. You know, then that's one of the things that the, the whole issue of national sovereignty is key. The, that in the U.S. is seen in another way. You know, because especially among leftist friends of us that hate that patriotic spirit that is usually associated in the U.S. to the right. Yes, right. But yes, here yeah. is different. Yeah. So it's important to make that difference to our audiences in the U.S. Yeah. because it's, it seems like to be con- like a contradiction. Yeah. But it's like the result of different approaches to patriotism. Which is different right. to what we call patrioterism, like petit patriotism, like like the one that is bad, the one that is the, the, uh, is not liked by the left in the U.S. for example. You well, know? people don't understand that. I think what what the narrative in the U.S. labels people in in here in Venezuela who are patriotic on the left, so to speak. Mm-hmm. That's the Chavismo movement. That's yeah. the Bolivarian Revolution movement. And that's how it's framed in the U.S. This is Chavistas, the Promodoro people, the revolutionary people. It's not defined as patriotism Mm -hmm. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. because it's not a right-wing patriotism. But it is patriotism. Of course. Yeah. It is patriotism. I mean, that's the movement that's been been running the country for the last 20 years. But those sanctions are killing us. Are killing us. And I was talking to you about that, that... that's, literally, that literally is, killing people. Yes, and that story the about the, the, the danger of people right now in Venezuela because of the problem with the fuel, taking buses full of fuel yeah, containers. Can you tell the audience about that, what you saw? That that, yes. That's yes, I mean, it's, it's an, I was told by a friend of mine because I, I have plans to spend the New Year's Eve in, in, inside, in the countryside in Venezuela. Uh, uh, and I, I haven't been able to do it because taxi drivers are charging you like a lot of money and, and bus drivers are like the, the, the lines are humongous these days because of the season but also because of the problem with the fuel and I was over a friend of mine that sent his son to the countryside of Venezuela that she was afraid when she dropped him in the bus station because uh, like the back part of the bus was full of uh, containers of with gasoline, and and she was first there was a problem with the luggage because they didn't have space for luggage, and then they were scared to death about the possibility of a disaster, an explosion, or something like that. So I mean, those are things that happen because of the sanctions. So and, and the same thing with the metro and all the problems we have with some services. Well, you can't you can't import the parts exactly. to keep the equipment running. And so is is that, I will say my I'll digress here just with the metro, but let's go back to the gasoline mm-hmm. in a minute. But I will say when I was here, the three months I was living in here in Caracas earlier this year. I used the metro almost you told every me. day. You told me that I and I know that. the year before, when I was here in 2018, 
I it was suggested I not use it. And at that and at that point, um, a lot of the cars didn't have interior lighting mm -hmm. and uh, air conditioning. and no air conditioning, and it was just suggested I I not use it. Whereas now March of 2019, it was a completely different situation because the parts were starting to be imported again to make the repairs. And in recent months, has been getting worse. So you can't get the parts. Yes, and, the, and, and I believe that they, 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 they lack enough trains, so you have to wait like 15 minutes for a train in the, in the, in the station. So this is what happens when you can't buy things on the international market. Mm -hmm. You can't buy parts, you can't, you know, when it, you, you can't buy new train cars, you probably don't even need new train cars, you probably just need to be able to purchase and import the parts. And there might be them. a disaster. I mean, I, I'm actually, I've been using the Metro since maybe because my car got broke, mm -hmm. I told you. And, and I've been using the Metro every day because I have to pick up my son in the east of Caracas. So I have to travel all the way from, from here in the west to the east of Caracas. And it's complicated, and sometimes I, I feel afraid of like a disaster is about to happen. Actually, one of my last trips this year was in the first week of December, and, and, and the, I, I, we actually posted something in Orinoco Tribune about the experience because that day there were like six people injured because a train got stuck in the middle of the, of the between the stations, you know. Oh. And, and and people opened the doors and yeah. went through and, and, and six it's people got injured because of that. But a few, I believe that last year there was a derailment. And I mean, I believe, I believe that it's a miracle that a disaster has happened. Well, I think, you know, well one, it's really hard to keep anything within, this would be in any country, mm -hmm. to keep infrastructure functioning when it's when you are not able to buy mm -hmm. replacement parts, new parts, new cars to keep things functioning, and not just the metro system, pretty everything. much everything. You, everything. Can't, you can't import tires, batteries, all those things, and that's because of the sanctions. There's no way that you you have purchasing power, even if a even if a company w overseas wanted to sell to Venezuela, the bank's not going to transfer that's the money. To them. Not yeah. happened. Yeah. That's true. So that ripple out. It's just very hard to yes. on people, you, your family, and your friends. Mm -hmm. That average people trying to just run a normal life, mm -hmm. just navigating a normal day, yes. it's incredible. And yet you're all doing it. And another dimension is the one that we were talking about, about the trips, international trips. Yeah. Well, you want me to tell you what it took for me? Yes, please <laughs> illuminate the audience with your experience well, getting to Venezuela. So I want all of you to know that you can get to Venezuela. Of course. And it is totally worth coming if you so desire. You can get here. And um, and there's one thing that I'm going to overtly promote. Two things I'm going to overtly promote, and I don't know if you can if I can say the name. So, yeah, so um, there's a there's a website called Kiwi.com, like New Zealand. I know Kiwi. That. I know that. You can go there and you can actually book an itinerary with Final Destination CCS Caracas. It, uh, and that's because I believe that website is run out of Czechoslovakia. Okay. So it's not a U.S. based website. Because Expedia and Norwich oh, no, and those do, ones do no, not you can't have even that fly. option anymore. They don't allow you to put Caracas as your final destination. Right. Because Lately, because of sanctions. U.S. carrier, and this is just since I was here in the spring, because mm -hmm. I had to change my way home, actually, mm -hmm. um, that U.S. carriers are not allowed to fly into Venezuela any longer. And so because of that, if you, you cannot create a travel itinerary with final destination Caracas. Mm -hmm. So you have to go, say, into Panama, round trip, and then have a separate itinerary in Panama, Caracas round trip, which is totally doable and fairly easy mm -hmm. to do on COBA, the Panamanian airline. Yes. It's expensive now to fly COBA. Especially, especially, especially now, in holidays. It's really expensive yes. right now. But COBA can do it and they understand what's happening and can make it fairly easy for you. But this Kiwi.com website. They give you nice Yeah, and it's, it's run out of 
It's very affordable. It's run out of Czechoslovakia, and you can just go online and book directly to Karagi. You have, I think, one or two connections, but you can book with Final Destination Karagis. And it's relatively affordable. But otherwise, it takes some real creativity yes, and some patience. Yes, tell us your story. <laughs> so, tell us your story, please. So, because that's, I, I, I don't want, I mean, you were telling me that you didn't want to talk too much about that because that might discourage people to come yeah, to Venezuela. And the idea is but not some people to do might that. Be encouraged. It's like, oh, yes, it's so hard to get there. Yes, and I yes there are, there, there's people <laughs> like around there humor, that right? like the hard work stuff. Yeah. But, but, but I believe that it's important to highlight all the troubles that you have to pass to come to spend, uh, I mean, Christmas Eve here in Venezuela because it shows how sanctions affect people's lives. And not, and not just someone like me, but uh -huh. even Venezuelans want to return tourists, home Or tourists, and yeah. tourism is a source of income for Venezuela, yes. and they put and a, a lot of... it's a fantastically beautiful country to come to. That's true, and that, and that put a lot of additional trouble to people wanting to travel to Venezuela. Yeah. And, and if people know that those problems are there, they might try to circumvent the problems in advance instead of getting stuck in Bogota, like the <laughs> friend of us that we were talking yeah. a few minutes ago that got stuck in Bogota a few months ago, and, and she had plans to come to Caracas. So things like that happen a lot. Well, they happen even when you think you've got a legitimate itinerary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, so for me, um, one, I would just encourage your viewers to come here, as many, many of us in the States continue to do with Cuba, despite the fact that, that U.S. citizens are not allowed to go to Cuba as tourists and spend U.S. dollars there for many, many years. People have been flying, you know, driving up to Toronto and flying in with the Canadians or going into Mexico and mm -hmm. flying in through Cancun to, you know, just to make a statement against the blockade on Cuba. And I think the same sort of action should be done here. Yes. Now, you can fly here. Let me just tell you what it took for me to get here on Monday. <laughs> but I didn't but it can be done. I had booked uh, a I went ahead and booked on kiwi.com. And so I was flying Baltimore uh, on Spirit Air, Baltimore to Fort Lauderdale, Spirit Air Fort Lauderdale to Bogota, and then picking up the Venezuelan airline Avior, mm -hmm. Bogota to Caracas. And I did that earlier this year beautifully. Mm, also beautifully. It, to you. it went. It we went. have to add to that that we are in Christmas, and usually in Christmas, yeah. scenes well, got messier anywhere. everywhere. Exactly. Yeah, not exactly. just here, mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. But what happened to me this trip was that the airport in Fort Lauderdale flooded on Monday mm -hmm. due to heavy weather. And so I missed, I was not able to even leave Baltimore. We were sitting on the tarmac mm -hmm. on our plane on a, on a flight hold because um, we couldn't. No, no, nobody could land mm -hmm. in Fort Lauderdale. So by the time I got to Fort Lauderdale, my flight to Bogota had left. And um, there was... That's when everything <laughs> started. <laughs> <laughs> That's when everything kind of... You know, what do you do? You just take a deep breath and say, well, I'm stuck here for the day, maybe longer. But So I was not able to get a flight into Bogota until Thursday. And then my Bogota Caracas flight there was not another seat available for me until today. So, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, it's the holiday season. The airlines, they're, all the seats are sold. So, what I did, and I went, I did go on to Expedia.com, and I was able to see, and this is just because of running delegations, I knew, you How know, to reveal Copa. itineraries. The other option was Copa out of um, Panama mm -hmm. into. That way, if, I, if Spirit can get me from Fort Lauderdale to Panama tonight, meaning the 23rd, then I can get a morning flight from Panama to Caracas. And there was a seat available on Expedia.com to do With that. Spirit. No. So I had to go back to the Spirit ticketing agency in Fort Lauderdale and mm -hmm. say, when the airport opens, can you fly me tonight to, to Panama? Panama because you can't get me to Bogota until Thursday. But if I can get to Panama, Copa has flights into Caracas the following morning. And they and they did that. Spirit Air got me into Panama 
we were supposed to leave at 11 a.m. or 11 p.m. Excuse me. Flight delayed till 12 p.m. 1 p.m. We finally left. I think at 2:20 a.m. on the 24th. But I was able to get into Panama um, that morning and got a 9 a.m. flight from Panama to here. So that airline was not on my itinerary. But, but but you were at least able to eat the ajacas here in Caracas. Yeah, yes, seven <laughs> different families brought them by, seven different households. Ajacas are, are one of the main Christmas dishes we have here in Venezuela. Ajacas, we call it. It's some H -A -L -L -A -C -A, sort of... H-A-L-L-A-C-A. Mm -hmm, right? Some sort so. of tamales. It's different than tamales, but, but it's, it's very similar. similar. Mm -hmm. It's very similar. These are, it's cornmeal, mm -hmm. and it's from um, plantation, it's, it's, Slave food, mm -hmm. correct? Where mm -hmm. all the right. so the but so for your audience, the scraps, the dinner table scraps were all scraped Mixed off the table together. by mm -hmm. the slaves, put in a big bowl with what do you call it, maize or the, mm -hmm. the you know what those of us in California would know as you know tamales, mm -hmm. and or not just California, but what I grew up in California. They make like but, a stew out of. Yes, Everything too. that they got there, and they fill the the, the corn yeah, the cornmeal with uh, with all that the table thing, scraps. and they 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 wrap it up with plantain. Uh, with plantain leaves, and then we boil them. Yeah, that's and our so idea. do corn husks in in Mexico. Uh -huh. corn husks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but it's 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 from slave plantation days. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it has a really deep tradition, so and it's eaten all over the country. Yes, By everywhere. all economic levels, yes, yes, which yes. is really, it's which is fantastic yes, that yes. it's actually a, a national dish. I mean, because of the history. Everyone, means, everyone, so, everyone yeah. ate it. Yes, that's true. Yeah. It doesn't and everybody's matter. mother cooks better than mine. It's like, it's like, <laughs> that's like, that's a, that's a joke that we have here. That yeah. everyone says that the, the, their mom's ayakas are, are the better than anyone. So this is my first Christmas with ayakas. That's fine. I've had seven different health. Yeah, but it's, it's nice been really that you great. made it this the problems caused. But maybe, maybe you didn't. I would see. never not come here. You, you didn't want not anyone to here. forbid you to come. No. But but I but because of come. the sanctions, we don't have all the airlines flying right. to Venezuela that we had before. And there are not only the U.S. ones. There there are tons of. European airlines that well, are not the, flying the, the here. airlines that are in countries that are aligned with mm -hmm, the United mm -hmm, States, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's that ripple out effect. Yes. That, yeah. Yes. They they are sometimes scared of sanctions because right. they are receiving gasoline from Venezuela because Venezuela. It's been their traditional yes. Yes. It's a provider of airplane fuel. So so they they, 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 they some airlines are legitimately just care because of being uh, the possibility of being sanctioned right. by the U.S. So they're not also. sanctioned, but they're, they're, I think, what we call, what mm -hmm. the U.S. Treasury mm -hmm. Department calls overcompliance. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. They're not actually over. sanctioned, but they're afraid of the ripple out mm -hmm. effect, so they sanction they themselves. They prefer so to they avoid the ripple out effect, yeah. and they decide not to do business with Venezuela. And that do not happen only with airlines. That happened with Everything. any kind of business that Venezuela has been doing for decades with countries outside Venezuela, I mean international operations. So I think that's probably the best thing maybe for us to close on, is for people to understand that, and I know I hear this a lot at home in the States, and a little bit in Canada too when I was there in November, is that a lot of people feel that, well, you know, there's no U.S. boots on the ground, no military troops on the ground. So no We're not dropping bombs on Venezuela. So how bad can it be? Mm -hmm. It's bad. Yes, it's and it really, really, it, this form of economic, these economic coercive measures really have to be understood as a form of hybrid warfare. Yes, it yes. is it's warfare against the people. It's unconventional yeah. war. It's yes. unconventional and that's war. That's the biggest yes. thing. Yes. That's the biggest message that... It's like, the, as you were saying before, right? it's like a siege. Yeah, it's like a siege on a medieval city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And people really. died yeah. in, in well, the medieval the times because of the out, siege. Right? Exactly. To exactly. starve them into compliance. But we are inspired by the Cubans in the way they have been handling that siege. And I believe that we are going to be able to handle that siege. However, no, it takes, how long it takes. I mean. yeah. 
Yeah, adapting. So, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you for being here and coming. What a nice spontaneous conversation. Yes, really, please, really we appreciate didn't have it. it planned, but, no, but even but, better, right? Yes, yes, even better. Yes, we enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you, Terry, thank for you. coming. Thank you. Feliz and Navidad. Yes, you too. Yeah, you too. You too. Bye bye, guys. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Bye bye.